I'm Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Friday, January 27th, 2023. It's a few minutes after three o'clock in the afternoon here on the East Coast of the United States. Scott Ritter joins us now. Scott, many things have happened with respect to the war in Ukraine, uh, decisions in Moscow, events on the battlefield, decisions in Washington, decisions in Berlin. But I want to start with something you've written about extensively lately. In fact, your piece on it was the best I have seen on this event. And of course, as you know, thanks to you and Colonel McGregor, I've begun to devour everything I can get my hands on. And that is Ramstein. What happened in Ramstein, Germany, involving the uh, Secretary of Defense of the United States and many others in the past week? Well, on January 20th, they convened, I believe, the um, eighth uh, session of the what they call the Ramstein Contact Group. Uh, that's basically a forum where the defense ministers of NATO and allied states like Sweden, Finland, um, gather and, uh, and coordinate with their Ukrainian counterparts on the material support that Ukraine says it needs to continue this conflict with Russia. Uh, this current uh, iteration of the Ramstein contact group was um, notable because it came in the aftermath of a declaration made by General Zeluzhny, who is the uh, commander in chief of the Ukrainian armed forces, uh, where he said straight up, unless you provide me with 300 tanks, 500 infantry fighting vehicles, and 500 artillery pieces. In other words, a new army. A new army. Um, I'm going to lose the war with Russia. We, we can't win straight up said it to uh, The Economist magazine. Um, and so the Ramstein group met to meet this uh, requirement. And uh, wh what they emerged with was um, less than 50% of the infantry fighting vehicles that, uh, that General Zeluzhny uh, requested. And even these, the majority of them, 90 um, striker vehicles, aren't infantry fighting vehicles. They're infantry carrying vehicles. If you actually took them into the forward edge of the battle area in a modern war, they all be destroyed. Um, less than 20% of the artillery that was requested. And uh, at the time of the Ramstein group, um, barely 10% of the tanks that were requested. Now, since then, uh, there's been pressure placed on Europe to increase the number of tanks. And uh, right now, the number of armor vehicle or tanks that have been promised is still is less than 50% of that which was requested. But okay, what complicates this, go ahead. Before we get into tanks and Bradleys versus Leopards and the American tanks versus uh, the German tanks, um, you have your finger on the pulse of NATO. Uh, is there a fissure down the middle of NATO uh, between hawks like the United States uh, and doves? I'm just going to throw out a country, Finland, France. In other words, are there countries in NATO that see this for what it is, an inevitable Russian victory and the futility of the West getting involved. And are those countries at odds with other Western NATO countries like the United States and perhaps Germany after Joe Biden twisted their arms? You follow my question? No, I follow your question. I mean, I'll start off by saying there are definitely doves and hawks in, uh, in NATO that, uh, I mean, it was interesting to hear, uh, uh, Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense, and General Miley, uh, Mark Miley, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, come out of the Ramstein Group saying NATO's never been more unified in its entire history. Uh, what well, a load of farce. yeah! It's it's basically uh, you know horse horse dung. Um, the the NATO is extraordinarily divided, uh, and you know there are nations that are just saying straight up, we're not participating in this. There's other nations that uh, participate in a farcical level, meaning providing equipment that uh, doesn't work, can't work, won't work. But the, the most important thing is, coming out of the Ramstein group, is um, that none of them, none of them believe Ukraine can win the war. None of them. And the reason why I say that is, if you thought Ukraine could win the war, then you'd give Ukraine that which it claims it needs to win the war. Instead, you give them less than 50%, and it's staggered on a timetable, which means it'll never get there. You won't be properly trained on it. Um, it won't be logistically sustainable. So you're guaranteeing that Ukraine will lose the war, but you're creating the political image that we're doing everything in our power to help Ukraine win. If they fail to win, 
That's on Ukraine. Why did uh, President Biden, uh, Secretary of State Blinken, Secretary of Defense Austin, twist the arms of their opposite numbers in Germany to get Germany to spring loose with these leopard tanks? What is the significance? <laughs> Sounds like more than one. I put I put Chris on the other side of the house. Um, what is the significance, Scott, uh, of German tanks, if anything? Okay, let me let me try and answer the question. Uh, the um, the arm twisting that took place is purely political. Uh, the fact of the matter is, Germany is constrained by law uh, to provide military uh, equipment of this nature. I mean, there's a you know in the aftermath of the Second World War, there's this, uh, and today is Holocaust Remembrance Day. People should recall that. The um, there is this thing, never again. And that was about never again will we allow the Holocaust to take place. But Germany took that to heart. Never again meant never again will they allow Germany, and especially German industry, to be militarized in a manner which has German tanks going on Ukrainian soil to kill Russians, which is what people have been asking to do. Germany was the key here. The Leopard 2 tank is the most modern tank that's available in numbers sufficient enough to actually have a meaningful impact on the battle, but they can't be provided unless you, uh, Germany agrees to the exportation. Germany said, we're not going to do it unless somebody else steps up to the plate. The British said 14 Challenger tanks. That's nothing. The Germans wanted Americans. So the Americans said that they would, I apologize for this. The Americans said that they would uh, provide the M1 tank, but they're not. It's a lie. First of all, we're not giving the Ukrainians the real tank. The real tank has depleted uranium armor and can actually survive in a modern battlefield. We're not giving them that. We're giving them the old tank with steel armor, and we don't even have those. So it's going to take months to prepare these things, to produce them. Some people say they won't be available until the summer, the fall, maybe even next year, which means the M1 Abrams tank isn't part of this. It's all about Germany getting the German tanks freed up. And that's what the United States did. We misled the Germans. We lied to the Germans. We lied to the Ukrainians in order to get them to release these Leopard 2 tanks. Colonel uh, McGregor, our colleague uh, on uh, Judging Freedom and Elsewhere, says that the Leopard 2 tank is a far better tank than the Bradley. He agrees with you. It'll take months to get there. Here's Admiral Kirby on how long... The, the spokesperson for the Defense Department, though, in this clip, he's speaking from the White House, how long it will take the tanks to get there. Watch how reluctant his answer is. Battlefield. And given the process, what's the soonest the Abrams could get there? The, uh, the Pentagon, I think, talked about this uh, earlier today. There, there's no date certain on the calendar. But I think what we're looking at is what's probably going to be many months before they're actually there. Good, Pat. Thank you. Many months from now, will there even be a war going on uh, to receive the tanks or will the Russians have triumphed? Whatever many months means, it's got to be more than three or four if he's using the word many. Yeah, this, you know, these tanks aren't going to be provided from drawdown stocks. That's what previously had happened. We went and took equipment out of the American inventory and gave it to the Ukrainians. These tanks have to be built which means we have to get the money to the producer. They have to be built. And the timeline for that could be... This is different than the other military equipment we've been providing, which has been from either surplus or substance, but it's drawdown, the stuff already existed. Why are we promising something that doesn't exist unless the promise is fanciful or political, but not military, not militarily significant? Well, that's exactly it. It's it's not military. My bet is the M1 Abrams will never show up on the Ukrainian battlefield. Uh, because the reason why I say this is let's, let's just draw on, uh, on Zelensky, the president of Ukraine himself. He came out and said, if I don't get these tanks by August, it's too late. Now, what do you mean too late? It means the war is over. And he knows that. He knows it. Zeluzhny knows it. All the Ukrainians know it. That this war is over unless they receive overwhelming amounts of military support, which they're not getting. Let's um, get to the battlefield. Um, how, how is the Russian will to fight now that the troops that have arrived are either reservists called up and trained, probably vendor, veterans, they've been there before, not in Ukraine, but they've done something in the military before, or conscripts? 
how is the how would you characterize the Russian will to fight? And by Russian will, I mean of the grunts, of the troops on the ground, not of the generals. I, I would compare it this way. There's a great trilogy written by Rick Atkinson about the uh, the U.S. Army in World War II, and by the end of the first volume, Army at Dawn, which talks about uh, North Africa, uh, you get into the second one, Day of Battle, which gets into Sicily and Italy. And basically, he talks about the transformation of the American military from this conscript force that didn't know how to fight into this group that are still conscripts, but they're now hardened killers who know the only way they're going to go home is through Germany, through Berlin, killing the Nazis. That's the Russian army today. There's 300,000 guys that don't want to be in the military. 300,000 guys that would prefer to be home, but they know the only way to get home is by finishing the job on the battlefield, killing the Ukrainians, bringing this war to an end, and they are 100% motivated and dedicated to that task. What is the uh, status of the Ukraine army? Well, the best way to characterize the Ukrainian military today is to note um, <clears throat> this. Everybody, I think, has seen the videos of the uh, Ukrainian police running around chasing guys down and getting them into vehicles for mobilization. That tells you the enthusiasm that exists. Here's the other thing. You know the guys that are chasing them? They're cowards. They spent twenty to $30,000 to buy the right to stay off the front line to hunt these guys down. This is pathetic. There is no will to fight in the Ukrainian military. All right. Um, I want to run a clip from Stefano Sanino. Mr. Sanino was a high-ranking uh, official of the European Union. He's an Italian uh, diplomat. I, I, forgive me, I don't know exactly which committee he's on or which position he holds, but it's one of the positions in the EU that is full-time. Uh, he's fluent in English, so you're going to hear it in what we call in New Jersey broken English, but you can understand what he says. And I want your thoughts uh, on what Commissioner Sanino says about the nature of the battle going on. Putin has moved from a concept of special operation mm. to a concept now of a war against NATO and the West. So we are not speaking anymore about special operation to free up a country from a Nazi uh, leadership. Now we are speaking about the war with, uh, with NATO and with the West. Different story. Mm. Different story. Is he recognizing a realization that you and uh, Colonel McGregor and others have been warning about that there are forces in the West that want this to be Russia's war with the West? Well, I think what he's recognizing that is that uh, Russia recognizes it's a war with the West, and Russia is organizing itself and preparing for just that. Uh, the, you know, the Russian army that's fighting right now in Ukraine is not the Russian army that started this conflict. This is an army that has been built from scratch, rebuilt from scratch, to fight NATO. It's not, you know, when they, when they talk about closing with the Ukrainians, they're not thinking about these are Ukrainians. They're saying this is NATO. This is the collective West. And they're prepared to take this to whatever level the West wants to take it. But this is a Russian army that is trained, equipped, motivated, ready to win uh, to fight a NATO threat, not a Ukrainian threat. And how long is NATO and the West prepared to keep putting arms into Ukraine when inwardly they know that it's futile? Well, I think I think we've answered that question um, because Kirby won't be honest. The point is, we know, we know Ukraine has lost. We know it. Uh, the CIA director, General Mark Miley, have all briefed the Ukrainians on what the Russians are getting ready to do. And the Ukrainians know they don't have sufficient resources to match what the Russians are getting ready to do. This war will be over, as Zelensky said, by August. All right. I don't know to whom uh, Admiral Kirby uh, speaks. And by the way, I've met him uh, many times when I was at um, uh, Fox. He's a competent, charming guy. But right now he's got to mouth a political voice. I want you to uh, listen to his answer to a question about not how long the U.S. is going to be there, but how long this is going to go on. I think we need to prepare ourselves that uh, to uh, to co to continue to to have to continue to support Ukraine for for quite some time. I can't be perfectly predictive. Does he know what he's talking about? Quite some time, or this is not going to last quite some time. No. First of all, 
politically speaking, we have to remain committed to to supporting Ukraine. And so we know our own military leadership has said that Ukraine will not be able to evict Russia from Ukraine this year. They never will be able to. But we can't say that. So we say it's going to be a long fight. But the fact is, we can't, we're unwilling to give Ukraine the equipment they need to win the war in the time frame available, which means we know this war will be over come August, September, October of this year. Now listen to Admiral Kirby, who sounds as if, this will really get your blood pressure, Scott, who sounds as if Ukraine is a member of NATO. Take a listen to this. President Biden has said since the very beginning of this conflict that we take our Article 5 commitments to NATO seriously. Article 5, of course, is the notion that an attack on one is an attack on all. Uh, and we take that seriously. In fact, we take it so seriously that President Biden ordered an additional 20,000 American troops alone onto the European continent, and they still are there. Now, we'll be rotating them on, 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 in and out, but it'll the, 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 the net number of 100,000 American troops on the European continent has stayed the same and will stay the same for the foreseeable future. Boy, this is a lot to unpack. First, what the hell is he talking about, Article 5? Article 5 is irrelevant because, because Ukraine is not a member of NATO. There's no legal or, or treaty obligation whatsoever on the part of any country to come to the defense uh, of NATO. And secondly, why is he saying how many American troops uh, are in 100,000 more than usual, less than usual, or is sending more bodies there? Start with your third well, Kirby, uh, in my view, just a reference to Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. Well, first of all, the, the reference to Article 5, of course, has nothing to do with Ukraine. It has everything to do with the fears that have been promulgated by Poland and the Baltic nations about Russian aggression and the notion that because Russia went into Ukraine, Russia intends to go into Poland and the Baltics. And this is why we've sent the troops uh, into Europe to beef up the presence in the eastern areas uh, so that we can tell our NATO allies that if Russia were to make this uh, incursion, we would be there for them under Article 5. Um. 100,000 troops uh, in Europe, 40,000 uh, in Romania. I guess the other 60,000 are at Ramstein. I don't know. Uh, wh what do these numbers tell you? Is it what we traditionally, typically have kept there uh, in the post-Cold War era? Or is old Joe sending more uh, troops there in dribs and drabs so that when he decides we have to go to war, he has the bodies with which to do it? Well, let's be clear. During the Cold War, in order to fight a uh, Soviet military presence of 400 to 500,000 troops in East Germany, we had 300,000 troops permanently stationed in West Germany, and we were prepared to immediately rotate 250,000 more uh, using an exercise called Reforger. Prior to this conflict, we had around 60,000 troops in Europe. Uh, no tanks, by the way. They were all striker units, artillery units, etc. cetera. Um, now we've beefed it up to 100,000. This is through a rotation of heavy armored brigades and other, other brigades, for instance, like the 101st Airborne Division that's in Romania right now. The total number of troops is 100,000. I told you to fight a half a million Russians. We needed to have over 550,000. This 100,000 is a joke, literally a joke. It's zero combat capability. You try to project 100,000 Americans into Ukraine against not just the 700,000 Russians that they have now, but Russia just said they're expanding their military to 1.5 million. I mean, yay, good job, NATO. Because of what we did in Ukraine, Russia's literally building up a stronger army, a more capable army than they had prior to this conflict. I was going it's to really psychological. It has nothing to do with reality. Yeah. I was going to ask you if Putin is uh, depleting the strength of his army, but you've already put your finger on that pulse, and your argument is that, no, he's not depleting it. He's making it bigger and stronger. Yeah. The, the I mean, the fact is Russia's taking casualties. Let's not pretend it hasn't. But what Russia has done is transitioned from a peacetime military, which it was when it went in on the special military operation, to this new military that is full of combat veterans who know how to fight. 
Russia has fixed its mobilization problems. Russia has fixed its defense industry problems. You know, we can't, we promise tanks that we can't build. And it's going to take us months to get our defense industry to build a handful of tanks. Russia's building between 20 and 40 uh, T-90 modern battle tanks every month. What the is defense the industry is cranking, is cranking, cranking. It's um, in a land war to tanks. I thought that, uh, trying to remember my days from basic training, the infantry is the queen of battle. You remember that line? What, what, what is the significant significance of tanks? Well, today tanks have actually been diminished because yeah. uh, the the proliferation of um, you know guided anti tank yeah. missiles uh, amongst infantry means that if a tank goes out and tries to bum rush a uh, a, a unit that's dug in, uh, you're going to lose your tanks. The tanks have to operate as part of a combined yeah. arms team with sufficient artillery support, uh, dismounted and mounted infantry, and then the tank yeah. has some utility. But the tank has to keep moving, and the tank has to be supported. Um, Russia is trained to do this. We're trained to do this. You know who's not trained to do it with this new equipment they're getting in? The Ukrainians. We are literally feeding them suicide pills every time we give them this equipment. One of the uh, points you make in your uh, recent article that starts out about Rammstein, and it's a brilliant article, by the way, Scott, and, and it brings us down to the uh, ground uh, in Ukraine, is how, and I can't use the adjective because it's a military adjective, it's a four-letter word turned into a gerund, how blankety-blank miserable the Abrams and Bradley tanks are, how they break down all the time, how nearly impossible it is to keep them operating for Americans that have been trained for years on maintaining these things. Is this right? No, it's 100% right. Um, look, in, in the best of conditions, an Abrams tank for every one hour of operation in the field needs three hours of maintenance. Oh. That's the best condition. Now we put in combat conditions where you're not getting the proper, you know, continuous maintenance. Things get breaking down. You're probably looking at five to six hours of maintenance for every one hour of combat time. Um, this requires full-time, highly trained maintenance crews that the Ukrainians don't have. So the Ukrainians now, when a tank breaks, are going to have to take that tank and remove it out of Ukraine back to Poland or Germany to be repaired. This is an impossibly complicated logistical su uh, support mechanism. It's doomed to fail. Before I uh, let you go, uh, what is the name of your friend who's gotten as much sound in this as you have? That is Maverick, and I apologize for him. He, um, I, 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 I scheduled. The reason why I picked the 3 o'clock time table for you is that this was supposed to be a window where nobody was coming in and out of my house. But in the middle of the interview, somebody came in the house and the dog has just gone bonkers. So, so I apologize when, for that. Uh, I apologize when, Chris, for when Chris is here, he doesn't bark, but he nips at my hands and feet. I'm not sure which is worse. <laughs> Scott, no matter what we're talking about, uh, I know that our audience genuinely appreciates you and you know how much I do. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me, and thanks for tolerating Maverick. Oh, of course. Give Maverick our best. Judge okay. the ball. Yeah, okay. <laughs>